want to talk about faith today. It's one of the main reasons we're all here. Because of our faith in Jesus, right? But what is your faith? It's one of those things where you think you know what it means until somebody asks you, well, what does that mean? And then you're, well, that's a good question. We well, start out by saying that faith is basically belief in who God is, that Jesus is his son, that he came, born of the Virgin Mary, lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sin, was buried, rose from the dead bodily, and ascended to the Father. That's our basic beliefs, but is that enough? Is that really faith? Not according to James. In the book of James, it says even the demons believe that, and they shudder. So it has to be more than just belief. The belief needs to bring you to a place of trust. But it's still not the whole picture. Faith is when your belief and your trust lead you to action. It's when it impacts the way you live your life, the choices you make, the things you do. Let me give you a very simple illustration. This is a chair. I believe it to be a chair because it looks like what I think chairs are going to look like. So I can say with all assurance, this is a chair. I can even say that I trust it. It looks sturdy. Looks like it does what it's supposed to do. It looks like if you sat on it, it would stay sturdy and strong. But until I actually sit, I haven't acted on either my beliefs or my trust, have I? Putting it into action. Because you see, faith is not a noun, it's a verb. And if you look at that verb in the original language in the tense, it's what's called a present active participle, which means it's an ongoing thing. Faith is not just a one-time event. It's an ongoing thing. It's something that you continue to do day by day, situation by situation, moment by moment. Proverbs 3, 5 says, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. To me, that's faith in a nutshell. What it says to me is that faith is when you trust God completely, even when it doesn't even make sense. Even when I don't like what it is I see that he's doing. That's what faith is. And there are situations when we think we know how things should work. When we think we've got it figured out, the best course of action or the best outcome. And that's how we pray, according to our plan and our understanding. We expect God to do what it is we're asking. And then it doesn't work out that way. Anybody ever have that happen? <laughs> All the time. Sick person you pray for doesn't get well. The affliction or the situation you're praying about doesn't change, or it gets worse. What do we do then? That's the time for faith. That's when we hold fast to God no matter what, and believe in his word and trust in his faithfulness. I found a definition that I really like. Faith is a firm and certain conviction of God's goodness, whatever the short-term outcome. I like that. A firm and certain conviction of God's goodness, whatever the short-term outcome. It's a gift that God gives us. Faith is a gift. It's how we respond to the saving work of Jesus on the cross. Ephesians 2.8 says, For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not of yourselves. It's a gift of God. So even faith is a gift. But just like our act of faith is not a one-time thing, the gift of faith is not a one-time thing either. We don't just receive it so that we can believe in Jesus and become Christians. We can continually ask for it, and God will continually give it. The disciples at one point said, increase our faith. It's a good prayer. It's kind of like the manna came every day. It's like the daily bread we pray for in the Lord's Prayer. And we don't just need faith to be saved. We need it to live. We need, to get it through, we need it to get through the day because as followers of Jesus, there's two things that we have to deal with that are not very easy for us to deal with in our human nature. One of them is delayed gratification. Oh, we don't like that. We're in an instant society. We usually don't have to wait for many things, do we? Delayed gratification is tough. The other thing is when we are asked to trust in something that we don't understand. We're in a scientific age, and we think we should be able to get a good explanation for just about anything. So don't ask us to trust in something you can't explain to us. Well, faith involves both of those things. 
delayed gratification, and trusting in things that we can't always understand. I want to look at Luke's gospel this morning. So if you've got a Bible close by, turn to Luke. And we're going to look at chapter 7. So when somebody gets a page number, holler it out. We're going to start in the beginning of Luke 7. 10.22 in one of our versions. 10.23, okay. It's always 10.22. 10.97 in the other version. Well, last week we read from the beginning of Luke's gospel about how Jesus healed the Roman centurion's servant. And Jesus was in Capernaum, and while he was there, some of the Jewish officials came to him and said, there's this Roman centurion whose servant that he really cares about is very sick, and we want you to go heal him. And they said, look at verse 4, this man deserves to have you do this because he loves our nation and built our synagogue. So Jesus went with them, and when he got there, well, actually, before he got there, the centurion sent his servants out to meet Jesus, and he said, look at verse 6. He was, they were told to tell Jesus that the centurion said, I do not deserve to have you come under my roof. This is why I did not even consider myself worthy to come to you. Well, that's interesting. The Jews said, this man is worthy for you to do this, and he said, no, I'm not. I'm not worthy. I'm not worthy for you to come at all. Now, what were the Jews basing the worthiness of this man on? He built their synagogue. He loves their nation. He did good stuff for them. He earned this. He done good things for God, so now God needed to do something good for him. You ever think like this? Well, look at the rest of that passage. Look at verse 7. The centurion also said by way of his servant, Say the word, and my servant will be healed. For I myself am a man under authority with soldiers under me. I tell this one, go, and he goes, and that one, come, and he comes. I say to my servant, do this, and he does it. This guy understood authority and power because he was a man of authority and of power. Centurion meant that he was a soldier over 100 other soldiers. So he was under a higher authority, a higher ranking officer, but he had many underneath him as well. He understood how this works. You don't have to actually put your hands on something to get it done. You simply command that it be done, and because of your authority and the power of your position, it gets done. He understood this, and he knew in Jesus the power of God to heal his servant was present. He believed that. And look what Jesus said about him in verse 9. I tell you, I have not found such great faith, even in Israel. Remember, this is a Roman, a hated Roman. He didn't commend the faith of the Jewish elders who came to him seeking healing. He commended the faith of this Roman. The Jews were expecting kind of a quid pro quo situation, you know, a tit for tat. But the Roman centurion's humility and his faith in God's goodness and mercy and in his power were what Jesus commended. And of course the servant was healed. Now let's look a little further into the passage I just read from you, beginning at verse 11. Now that Jesus, Jesus is with his disciples and there's a big crowd, I imagine they're pretty excited. You know, miracles are pretty cool. They would draw a crowd. They've moved on from Capernaum and they've come to a town called Nain. And they're a big, happy, boisterous crowd. They're excited. Jesus is encouraged. He's seen some faith. <laughs> That's got to be encouraging to him. The disciples are encouraged. The crowd's excited. And they meet another crowd. Very different crowd. They're not all jazzed up. They're very subdued, very sad. They're very discouraged. It was a funeral procession. Now, in that culture, it was likely that this was an open coffin. In fact, it was probably just a wooden plank with the body on it with a cloth over it. And there would have been a procession to the graveyard because the graveyard would have been outside the city limits. And leading the way would have been the grieving mother. Now, you've probably seen Middle Eastern funerals on TV. They are not stoic in their grief. There's wailing. There's just heart-wrenching sorrow over the death of this person that is loved. And in this case, it's a widow, and it's her only son. That puts her in a terrible position. In that culture, for a woman to be alone was a dangerous thing. Men not only protected, but they provided. And she was all alone in the world with nothing to trust in and nothing to hope for. Well, look at verse 13. 
When the Lord saw her, his heart went out to her, and he said, don't cry. The compassion of the Lord, the mercy, the love, the tenderness. He said, don't cry. He, was, he knew what he was about to do. He was going to turn that sorrow into joy. He went over and he touched the funeral beer, and he said, young man, get up. And he did. And he restored the woman's son to her. Now, we just had two miracles side by side in Luke's gospel. Well, look at this one, though. There's no mention of faith. You ever hear it mentioned at all? There's, there's um, no one has asked for anything. Nobody has approached him. Nobody said, this lady needs your help. Jesus acted out of his own initiative, out of his compassion, and out of his love. You know, if you pay attention to the miracles of Jesus in the gospel, I don't think he ever does anything the same way twice, especially when it comes to healing. You know, he, he healed Peter's mother-in-law by taking her hand and lifting her up, and then he heals the centurion's servant without even being in the room with her. He healed one blind man by making a mud paste and putting it on his eyes. That's really strange. And then he heals blind Bartimaeus by simply speaking to him. Your faith is healed you. He touched the lepers. He, there's no pattern. There's no rhyme or reason to what he's done. No formula. No four easy steps to follow to get God to answer your prayer. Although I have seen that on the internet. It would be great, though. I would love to get up here this morning and tell you, God wants to answer your prayers, and this is how he's going to do it. You just say this prayer. You put your hands like this. You tap your heels three times, and boom. God's going to heal. <laughs> Boy, we'd pack this place, wouldn't we? <sighs> well, God is just not, God is not only a gift giver. Gift giver. God is not only a healer. He is those things. He is. But he is a being. He's a person. He has a mind, a perfect mind, and he has a sovereign will. He's the one that we are called to trust with our whole hearts and not lean to our own understandings. He's the one we're called to have faith in. Paul said in Romans chapter 4 that God is the one who calls things that are not as though they were. I love that passage. Calls things that are not as though they were. And what that tells me for is we can pray for the impossible. We can pray. And sometimes God will move. God will act. I've seen healings in my life. I've seen healings in others' lives. I hope you have too. It gives us the, the courage to keep praying, even when we don't see those things. We know God can move. We just don't know how or when or sometimes even if. Those are prayers of faith. Because it's also the courage to accept when the answer we get is no. When the thing that we had hoped for doesn't come about. And we see examples of this in the scripture as well. Yeah, there's lots of healings, but there are also times when Jesus didn't heal. Think about Lazarus. Mary and Martha said, Lord, our, son, our, our brother is sick. He's going to die. Please come. Jesus was very close by, and he didn't move. He let Lazarus die. Paul had a thorn in his flesh. He prayed fervently, pleading with the Lord, whatever this thorn was to take it away, and Jesus didn't. He said, my strength is made perfect in your weakness. Now, did Mary and Martha lose their faith because Jesus allowed Lazarus to die? Mm -hmm. No, they met him and said, Lord, if you'd been here, we know he would have lived. But I know that you are the Lord, the Messiah, the Son of God. And of course, we know that he called Lazarus out of the tomb. And that's what he'll do for all of us one day. We'll be called back to life as well. Paul continued to serve him faithfully, despite lots of hardships, even though God had not answered this one prayer, this one personal prayer of his, to relieve him of this thorn. A great example of this kind of faith in more modern day times is a woman named Fanny Crosby. You ever heard of Fanny Crosby? Mm -hmm. You've heard her even if you don't know you've heard her because she wrote over 8,000 hymns in her lifetime. And I'll bet one of your favorites is one of the ones she wrote. 
But the thing about Fanny that most people don't know is that she was blind from the age of six weeks old. And the reason she was blind was because of the incompetence of the doctor. It was a stupid medical mistake that cost her her eyesight. But she went on to write hymns like Blessed Assurance and To God Be the Glory and Pass Me Not, O Gentle Savior. Those are my favorites. She was a woman of incredible faith. She did not grow bitter over this terrible thing that happened to her. She, in fact, wondered if God might have not allowed her to do her ministry more effectively because she wasn't distracted by having sight. Now, there's, there's an attitude for you. And she also loved to tell people, you know, the very first thing I'm ever going to see is the face of Jesus. Amazing faith. Incredible faith, despite the short-term outcomes. She was looking at the long term. It's amazing faith. The ability to have firm and certain conviction of God's goodness despite the short-term outcome. That's the kind of faith that Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego had when they were stood up against um, King Nebuchadnezzar. Daniel Free, if you haven't read it, you should read it. King Nebuchadnezzar made this big, giant, golden statue of himself, and he declared everybody had to bow down and worship it. And these three Jewish men who were in captivity refused to do it. They were threatened with the fiery furnace. They were going to get thrown in the furnace, and they said, if you throw us into the flames, our God can save us. But even if he doesn't, we'll never bow down and worship this false idol. Amazing faith. They had a firm and certain conviction of God's goodness, despite the short-term outcome. <coughs> this one also was a miracle. They were spared but there are countless Christian martyrs that weren't spared, who had the same amazing faith, who went facing torture and even death, trusting in God's goodness. They held fast to their faith and their beliefs, and they trusted God. They trusted in the long-term promises that God had prepared a place for, him, for them, with him in heaven, and that Jesus had gone before and opened the way for them to follow. Here's an incredible example of this kind of faith that was found scratched into the wall of a cellar in Cologne, Germany. And it, it was believed to be written there by a Jewish, a Jewish person hiding from Nazi persecution. Scratched into the wall in a cellar. It says, I believe in the sun, even when it's not shining. I believe in love, even when I can't feel it. I believe in God, even when he is silent. Amazing faith. We have a powerful and compassionate Savior. And He can and does heal today. So we pray with confidence. Not that things are going to turn out exactly like we expect. We pray with confidence knowing that God can and does heal, but that He knows the long term results. And we can trust His goodness and His sovereignty and His faithfulness. This has been a really hard sermon for me to write because I believe every single word I have said to you with my whole heart, but that doesn't make it easy. It just doesn't make it easy. It hurts when we pray faithfully for someone we love and they don't get better. Or when we go and say goodbye to someone who died far too soon. It's hard. It hurts. We know how we want it to work out. And sometimes it just doesn't work out that way. But I have to remember, at times like this, all the other things that God has shown me about himself. All the times he has moved in ways that just made my heart rejoice. And I have to remember that the times when he doesn't do what I want him to do doesn't nullify all the other times when I was able to rejoice in the things that he did. He's not bound to my way or my will, but I'm bound to his. He's not limited to my understanding, thank God, but I am certainly limited in my ability to understand him. At the end of the day, faith is a choice. It's an act of our own free will to embrace the love of God as it has been revealed to us in Jesus Christ. And so I choose faith, even when it's tough. And when it is tough, I'm grateful that we have one another. 
to come alongside and share our frustration and remind us of God's goodness. I want to have that amazing faith. And I want it for all of you too. Let's pray. Lord, I get very frustrated when I hear people talk about Christian life is just one big happy party because we know it's not. You told us, Lord Jesus, that in this life we would have trouble, but that we should have faith because you have overcome this world. Help us to remember that, Lord. Help us to trust in your goodness and your love and your mercy, even when we can't understand your ways and don't agree with your timing. Lord, we're asking for that kind of faith, knowing that it is yours to give, and knowing how much it must delight and encourage you when we actually achieve it. Help us, Lord, to love you more. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Let's stand now together, turn to page two, and affirm our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. <clears throat> 